Hi guys, we'll cover chapter eight this week. Um, still focused in on populations, but now considering spatial spread and invasive species. So range expansions, um, invasions are inherently spatial processes and a lot of the ways we analyze those um, are the same spatial tools that we've used and talked about already. Um, we'll talk through the different stages of spatial spread of organisms, which includes introduction and colonization, establishment, and then dispersal to new areas. When we think about spatial spread, it really is the interaction between dispersal of organisms and demographics of those populations within the landscape structure. Um, we know that humans have played a major role in facilitating the spread of organisms um, and disease for that matter. And we do this through our ever globalizing economy, through disturbance and through transport. Um, and we also know that invasive species are major threat to biodiversity. So one that requires a lot of thought and attention on our part. So landscape effects um, on species range shifts. This first topic we'll talk about the concept of range shifts um, is the result from differential survival, reproduction, dispersal of individuals, usually over many generations, um, and collectively it's the change of the distribution of populations. So we can see positive population growth um, through a range expansion. We can see negative um, population growth through range constriction, which generally happens on the periphery of the range where species are on the edge of their um, climatic tolerances or habitat requirements. And we often, we talk a lot now about climate driven range shifts as well. Then that's a population's response to climate changes along latitudinal and elevation gradients. Um, so we know that when we think about ranges, of course, we know the distribution of most species is limited by climatic factors. As we discussed last week, um, we might view those minimal requirements for a species as the fundamental niche of an organism. Um, one of the examples in the book of climate driven range shifts from research and one of the few empirical examples that we have is of the Edith's checker spot butterfly. So this figure captures range shift of the checker spot butterfly over the past century. Um, we see that the species have shifted its range about 100 kilometers north along that uh, latitudinal gradient, as well as about 100 meters upslope in elevation. Um, and on the southern end of that range, what they see with the species is that um, population extinction is happening at a rate disproportionate to, um, to extinction rates in other parts of the range. And so we are seeing both the northward expansion and a southward uh, restriction of the species or constriction of the range. Um, modeling species distributions in response to climate change. This figure 8.2 shows a study that projected ranges of the distribution of birds, mammals, and butterflies throughout Mexico. Um, and through a series of extinctions and new invasions, the model predicted species turnover across the country. Um, so figure A shows us areas of new colonization. B shows us areas where we might anticipate lo local extinctions. And then C shows the cumulative change 
um, you can see that the Baja Peninsula shows up as an area of, of extremely high change. So these kind of species distribution models have been used to predict the effects of climate change on species. Um, similarly, environmental niche models have been used with assumptions about future landscape conditions to predict the ability and um, assess the, predict the predicted change in habitat area relative to the species current distribution. So really just tweaking some of the models that we've already talked about in this class um, to emphasize future conditions expected with climate change is how we might um, assess this. We know that climate shifts and fragmentations actually leads to ecological winners and losers. Not all species um, will have a negative response to the changing climate. So there are some species, habitat generalists, that are going to experience range expansions um, with a predicted increasing disturbance and a warming climate. Um, also, not all range expansions are climate driven right now, of course. In some cases, we'll see a range expansion because some other biotic change, um, such as the removal of a predator or the introduction of a new prey species within a landscape allows for an organism to expand its range. Um, but generally, it's important to consider the impacts of fragmentation and how they interact with climate change impacts. We know that fragmenting features um, in the landscape really can create barriers for movement and for um, shifting ranges. Um, and we've all looked at some of that within the Nature Conservancy's climate resilience modeling at the beginning of the semester. And uh, one particular study that tracked the ability of, of tree species to migrate within a fragmented landscape, the scientists actually found that um, the degree of fragmentation did not have a, a, much of a confounding effect until we got down to about 25% habitat availability. And then there was um, an ever increasing um, impact of that fragmentation. So let's, uh, let's de dive a little deeper just into the topic of invasive species. Um, so invasives are species that do not naturally occur in a specific area whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Um, we have non-native species that are not invasive. We have some uh, native species that, that have been released in a way where we might consider them invasive. Generally, an invasive is, can be any kind of organism, any amphibian, plant, insect, fish, fungus, bacteria, um, can even be an organism, seeds or eggs um, that's not native to an ecosystem and that causes harm. That harm can be environmental, it can be economic, or it can be human health. Usually, uh, traits of invasive species are that we see rapid growth and reproduction. We see um, invasive and aggressive um, spread of the organisms and that we see some kind of response like a re reduction in biodiversity. And often we see um, competition between the invasive species and some of the native species in an ecosystem. So there are a number of ways that invasive species are introduced. Um, they, we know that they are spread primarily by human activities, often unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. Um, people and the goods we use travel around the world very quickly these days. And um, we see invasives coming in on ships. They can be carried in on um, through ballast waters. 
We see them coming in as pests uh, within wood products, sometimes within shipping pallets or crates. We see ornamental plants, non-natives, um, escaping into the wild and becoming invasive. And we more and more are seeing impacts from the pet trade. Um, some invasive species may be intentionally or accidentally released. Right now, uh, an example of this are the Burmese pythons, which are a huge problem in the Everglades. Um, and then we have had some good intentions gone wrong where the use of biological controls have actually turned out to be, um, to be invasive species. So some of our worst invasives were introduced as a control measure for another invasive species. I think we've learned a little bit um, over the decades to be more cautious when we use biological controls. Um, threats of invasive species, we know that there are direct threats where invasives may prey on native species, um, outcompete native species for food and other resources they might cause or carry diseases. They might prevent native species from reproducing um, or kill their young. And then there are also many indirect effects where we see changes in food webs, dynamics, um, decreasing biodiversity. Invasives can alter the abundance or diversity of species that are important habitat for native wildlife. Um, aggressive plant species like kudzu can quickly replace a diverse ecosystem and create a monoculture just of kudzu. And then we also see altering ecosystem conditions. Um, so impacts on things like habitat structure, nutrient cycling and disturbance regimes. So let's talk through the various stages of invasion. Um, it, it takes a lot more than just the introduction for a species to actually become invasive. So introductions, um, we do know that we can make some predictions about how often, when, and where invasive species introductions might happen. Geography and topography can play a role in influ influencing when and where biological um, introductions are likely to occur. We know that they're more likely where people are. Um, so lower elevations have more human disturbance, we're more likely to see disturb to see invasives there. And also ports of entry um, can set the stage for both terrestrial and aquatic invasives. And then human settlements um, where we might see ornamental plants or um, feral livestock or feral pets being released. And we also know that um, habitat fragmentation can play a significant role in increasing the, the invasibility of a landscape. Um, colonization and establishment often depends on the availability, the suitability, the distribution, and types of disturbances habitats and resources at a site of introduction. So it's not enough for um, the organism just to be to be uh, introduced. Often it takes many introductions in one place for a establishment or a colonization to occur. Um, so those repeat introductions are generally required and it may take some time for that. So really, it, the chances are in most introductions that they are, they're not gonna result in a colonization. Um, but if enough of them happen with enough frequency, then there is the, the opportunity for interbreeding and establishment of a population. Um, the next stages are dispersal and formation of more structured populations. So once we have that colonization and it's established, we know that, um, that there may be enough propagule pressure um, to allow for dispersal and colonization of new areas. Um, 
So the criteria for when an invasive species has become established really relates to its ecological impact on other species. And in landscape ecology, our focus is usually going to be on attributes of landscapes that might enhance or impede that spatial spread. Um, and in order to get to that last stage of invasive spread, there's often a lag time um, between introduction and establishment and when there's enough um, demographic pressure where we might refer to the population as becoming invasive. It might take a century um, before we get to that point. It's interesting to think through these different uh, stages of invasion and how we might view them from a landscape perspective. Um, so I really like this, this figure in your book that took the time to think about the spatial elements and the way spatial and uh, temporal configuration um, and research might help us understand each stage in invasion from introduction all the way to invasive spread. So there are a few different models of, spot of um, invasive spread that the book addresses that are, that are worth pausing on. The simplest of these, the classic reaction diffusion model, was first based on a, a classic study that used uh, reaction and diffusion to model the spread of an invasive muskrat throughout Central Europe. And the reaction in this model represented the, the reproduction or population growth of the mu muskrat, while the diffusion really represented random movement of the individuals out um, from a population core area. So it resulted in sort of an average rate of population spread. This model assumes a homogeneous environment and a fairly consistent rate of population growth, which we know both of those assumptions don't generally hold up in reality. Um, so the neoclassic model of spatial spread built off of that reaction diffusion model um, that assumes the homogeneous environment. Um, but in this case, we actually consider the fact that reproductive success is often stage or age dependent. And so neoclassic models um, break life stages into different events and are able to differentiate different reproductive rates during different life stages. Um, and this sort of ma modeling has moved into to more so sophisticated mathematical approaches that are better able to incorporate um, heterogeneous landscapes and spatial spread, just as when we integrate landscape population models. Um, one example of this is the long distance dispersal events. We know are clear drivers of species spread. Um, the cereal leaf beetle spread predictions were off by about two orders of magnitude, likely because of our inability to predict the role of some uncommon long distance dispersal events. And so that's an important factor that's been particularly difficult for us to capture in um, our development of, of spatial spread models. This figure captures the concept that um, of connectivity facilitating the spread of, of both native and non-native species. Interestingly, um, in these figures, what we see is that network distance, so that's a measure of functional connectivity, was a better predictor of, um, of movement and spread than straight line distance or even environmental similarity of um, patches. And so um, the book discusses a sort of fascinating conundrum that depending on the invasive corridors of even native habitats may become ideal conduits for invasives 
um, as much as corridors of um, fragmentation may be. So there's no simple catch-all um, strategy when we think about landscape configuration to consider um, to stop the spread of invasive species. Um, so a little bit more on this concept of landscape connectivity and invasive spread. So if habitat loss and fragmentation enhance the potential for biological invasions, then it would be useful to have an understanding of what level of disturbance um, helps to facilitate that spread. So we can use connectivity as a proxy um, of spread using some of the same tools we've talked about in chapter five, such as graph theory or um, percolation based approaches. Also neural landscape models have been used to provide insights into the degree of disturbance um, that might enable an invasive species to spread. Um, but as I was just saying, whether fragmentation enhances or impedes invasive spread really depends on the relative effects of the landscape structure on different phases of the invasion process and on the organism itself. So in this case, we look at we can look at neutral landscape models um, to help us think about the potential for invasive spread and how we might as assess that in terms of prob probability. So in this particular model, the largest extent of spatial spread that shows up in the circle in dark green um, is highlighted in each landscape. And it assumes that the species is only able to move through disturbed areas in this case, which show up as light green areas. And it's able to use uh, nearest neighbor assumptions to actually map out what we predict will be uh, an area of spread. So we see ecologists pairing some metapopulation models um, and habitat distribution models to try to predict where we might have uh, spread of invasive species. So some of the, of course, the same dynamics that we see playing out um, with source sink metapopulations happens after population establishment, maybe right before or even during a time when uh, the stages where an invasive becomes an invasive species. Um, and so understanding those sort of metapopulation dynamics are really important to understand our pathway to controlling these species. And then with species di distribution models, um, we can use the same kind of um, dynamics of predicting ranges um, as we do in predicting range shifts in response to climate. Um, we can look at current distributions and try to predict future distributions of invasive species. Um, it can be helpful to be able to identify areas where non-natives may occur and where they're likely to thrive. And that's, that's what we see in this habitat suitability um, model that they did for the Malabar plum, where they were able to, um, to predict, one, the, the most ideal habitat and then two, also where we anticipate um, having viable populations of the species. And we can look at where those two overlap and have the li highest likelihood of becoming invasive. Um, the book goes into the concept of landscape epidemiology, which seems particularly relevant for us right now. Um, coming out of a global pandemic. And um, so in, in landscape epidemiology, we can really think through um, the role of disease and one, how it shapes our landscape and how our landscape shapes it. 
We know that disease spread is just another form of biological invasion and follows a lot of the same rules that we've talked about already. Um, when we think about spatial epidemiology, it really did rise independently as a discipline, but it shares so many similarities um, and so it's sort of converged with landscape ecology as a discipline. The concept of disease nidality um, was introduced by a Russian parasitologist who proposed the concept that diseases have an ecological niche. And landscape epidemi epidemiology is the study of the association between pathogens, species, and the landscapes, or the environmental conditions that are responsible for incidents and for the spread of diseases. Um, we know that a disease nidus is generally determined by three factors, not unlike a species niche. We would consider climate, um, what temperature thresholds we see or moisture thresholds are required or are ideal for a species transmission. Um, we also can think about the transmission requirements. So that includes vectors of the disease, host species that are needed to complete its life cycle. And then often um, there are habitat associations between pathogens or those vectors and hosts that are required for its spread. And those sorts of habitat uh, associations are very mappable. The other thing that's mappable is where we have those habitat associations coming in contact with human populations. And so it's a way we can infer risk um, to people. So we do know that various landscape elements may act as barriers or, or facilitators to disease spread. Um, in some cases, rivers may inhibit the spread of something like rabies, or they might facilitate the spread of a disease, which was the case with the, um, the rice yellow model virus that was in Africa. Roads have also been seen to facilitate disease spread um, along road corridors. An example of this was the fact that snails that were infected with a parasitic flatworm in Alaska were only found within 330 meters of major highways. Um, in this case, Snails were not even the final host of this parasite, but were passed along to native species. Um, caribou and wolves were both being infected with the parasite by either purposefully or inadvertently eating, eating those snails. Um, an interesting example of how landscape ecology can interact with disease is one that we see in Hawaii with the current distribution of native birds in Hawaii. Um, avian malaria was first detected in Hawaii back in the 1940s and is the cause of a unicellular microorganism that native birds had no um, defense against. And we know as with human malaria, Avian malaria spread through mosquitoes, which were introduced to Hawaii um, through ships that came with mosquito eggs in the water that they carried on the ship. And that disease causes birds' red blood cells to rupture, um, causes low oxygen levels, and ultimately um, is, has been a cause of mortality for lots of birds. One particular group of birds, Hawaiian honey creepers, had no immunity to the disease and have been hit particularly hard um, by the disease. And what we see now is that the species have been um, really restricted, relegated to higher elevation forest, cooler temperatures where we have fewer mosquito mosquitoes in Hawaii. So their, um, their fundamental niche where they could occur, their potential forest habitat that would be appropriate for them and their realized niche at higher elevations differ drastically.
because of the introduction of mosquitoes. And so there are um, public health campaigns that, that um, work to reduce the number of mosquitoes in Hawaii. And there's a little bit of evidence that we're starting to see some natural immunity involve um, after almost 100 years of coexistence with the disease. Um, it's intuitive that better understanding disease reservoirs and host effects and how habitat um, impacts those helps us better track and manage diseases. So we know that a lot of diseases are generalists. They can affect more than one species. Some species are not um, symptomatic, but can transmit the disease to other species, including humans. Um, so this concept of disease spillover is the transmission of diseases from a reservoir population to another host population. And this can be a major driver of disease dynamics. In a lot of cases, um, diseases that spill over may spill over from wild populations to domestic ones. And then we've seen that also in reverse, um, such as with the avian flu, which may originate in, in domestic chicken populations and spread to wild birds. Um, because reservoirs and vectors are connected epidemiologic, epidemiologically to other species or habitats, it's really important for us to, to identify who they are um, and to understand how to manage or control those. So we might also think about what landscape features are going to allow vector populations to increase. Um, this is something we can do also in predicting future conditions with climate change. And we've seen some of those types of studies about increase in, in mosquito populations with a warming climate and how that might impact distribution and rates of disease. Um, and then we also know that habitat changes such as habitat loss and fragmentation can have a significant influence on the abundance of um, reservoirs and host species. So um, just a really interesting application of landscape ecology in thinking about epidemiology. Got a couple of um, just brief videos that I thought you guys would find interesting. So take the time to watch these. Um, and that is it for the lecture this week.